Hello and good morning guys. Um, welcome to my kitchen for our children's message today. So I want you guys to think back. We have been reviewing this a couple of times, but I want you guys to remember what is the first fruit of the Spirit that we talked about. Remember there are nine of them. And the first one is love. So I think right now the world could use a lot of love. And the world could use the love of Jesus. And 1 John 4, 11 says, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another because God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross to forgive us of our sins and to be raised again so we can go to heaven. We also need to share that love with one another so other people will know God's love for them. And so what I want to talk to you guys about today is how we can say I love you without using actual words. And so what I mean by this is um, sometimes you can say I love you through gestures. So Nick and I, what we do is we take these fruit gummy snacks or Reese's and we hide them in each other's things so that when we find them, we can say, hey, uh, Nick was thinking about me. He says, I love you. Have a great day. Here's some snacks so you don't get hangry. And that's a great way to say I love you. So at the end of this video, I'm going to hide a fruit snack somewhere so that he finds it and knows that I love him. But we can also use sign language to say I love you. And so if you might have noticed, I did this when we started. And so this means hello in sign language. But to say I love you in sign language, you can do different ways. So the first way that we can say I love you in sign language is doing this. So these are all the letters for I love you put together. So this is I, L, you. I love you. So we can do that. That means I love you. Or we can do it um, more animated. So we can say I love you. Ready? That's I love you. We can also do Jesus loves you. And the sign for Jesus is this. That's Jesus. So we can do Jesus loves you. Ready? That's Jesus loves you. And we can tell other people that to know that we love them and that Jesus loves them. And then maybe we can tell them why Jesus loves them. All right? So we can also do, I love Jesus. And we can let people know that we love Jesus. And so those are some ways that we can say, I love you and share the love that God has given us with one another, that we can love one another as God has commanded us in his word. All right, so I guys, I want you to practice that week. Find ways to say I love you without using words. So we're going to pray, and then I'm going to hide these uh, fruit gummies. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the love that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. We just thank you for creating us. We thank you for putting us in this community, Lord. And I just ask your blessing over these children and their families, Lord, that you would watch over and protect them, that you would uh, pour your love and peace upon them, and they would pour that love and peace onto other people. We just thank you for everything, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So remember, guys, I love you, and Jesus loves you, okay? So I'm going to go hide these, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning on this Sunday, March the 29th, 2020. This is the fifth Sunday of Lent, and this is our third Sunday of quarantine because of COVID-19. Let's begin with prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness and for your grace. Thank you that you are aware and you are active. Thank you that you hear us when we pray and that you respond in accordance with your will. Thank you for your patience with us. And yes, we thank you for your discipline, for your word tells us that you discipline those that you love. Forgive us when we go off on our own way. 
Forgive us for resisting your instructions. We want to become more like Jesus, revealing your love to a world in need of your perfect, cleansing, healing love. Help us to listen and learn now with our ears and our hearts and our souls and our minds to your word. Your words truly are a lamp for our feet and a light unto our path all the time, but especially in the middle of a pandemic. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our new normal is not a bit normal, is it? Are we getting used to it? Sort of, but not really, right? I mean, we all look forward to, forward to the day when we can gather together again without incessant hand washing and hand sanitizer use. But in the midst of looking forward to that day, we can't forget about this day. And in this day, there are people who are very sick and who are suffering from this virus all over the world. And we have to remember to keep them and their loved ones and all those who are caring for them. We need to keep them constantly in our prayers. And we're going to do that before we close our time together today. But I just want to make sure that we don't forget um, all those who are affected in really intense ways. So in the midst of all this, our congregation is in the 2020 global year of the Bible. We, many, many of us have made the commitment to read through the Bible from cover to cover in this year. And this week found us um, finishing up the story of the judges and beginning then the story in for Samuel. In our readings this week, we learned about the judge Samson, who is probably one of the most notorious judges because of his strength and because of his long hair. You remember that story? The secret to his physical strength was in his, the length of his hair. But it was no secret when you read the story that he was not strong spiritually. He was, he was a mess. He was a womanizer and he was incredibly violent. However, in spite of his flaws, God used him against the Philistines, the enemies of the Israelites, when Samson used his renewed strength to bring down the Philistines. You remember the story? He, he put his hands against the columns in the temple where there, the Philistine temple, where there were over 3,000 men and women who were gathered. And he brought down that temple on top of everyone, killing everyone, including himself, as a final act of national heroism, if you will. God had given the Israelites everything that they needed to overcome, to defeat their enemies. I mean, most of all, he gave them himself. He gave them his strength and his protection and his instructions. He gave them what they needed to defeat their enemies. But in spite of their extravagant abundance that God had given to them, Many of his chosen people were wooed to worship other gods. We talked about this last week. They were wooed to worship other gods, man-made god, false gods, made of wood and made of stone. And many had set up in their homes shrines with these man-made idols there that they would worship. And they turned away from the one true God. We read this in Judges chapter 17, verse 6. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Well, that about sums it up, doesn't it? 
They did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And unfortunately, we see this, don't we, in the middle of this pandemic that we are in. We have people who are not following the social distancing rules, suggestions that are being put out there. They're doing whatever seems right in their own eyes. And unfortunately, what they may be doing may be extending this time of, of separation for many of us. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. It's really true, isn't it, that there's nothing new under the sun. Since the nation of Israel was born, it was led by Moses, who was led by God. It was led by Joshua, who was led by God. And now it's being led by judges who were sometimes, but not so much, led by God. And this whole nation started out wanting to be led by God. But when they finally made it into the promised land after these 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness, they, they just couldn't seem to get back to being wholeheartedly committed to God. And they couldn't seem to get back to even wanting, even wanting to be led by God. How quickly they forgot the works mighty works of the Lord. So it was a time of self-rule. People did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. And so what they did is they called for a king. They, they went to their final judge, who was Samuel, who was a faithful and committed to God leader, committed to God judge, who wanted to and who was led by God. And they said to him, and this is in 1 Samuel 8, verses 5 through 9, they said, give us a king to judge us like the other nations have. Give us a king to judge us like the other nations have. And here's what Samuel did. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not rejecting you. They don't want me to be their king anymore. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they're giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. Now, why would God tell Samuel to go ahead and give the people what they want? Why didn't he just stomp his kingly foot and say, no, no, you may not have a king. I am your king and I know what is best for you. Why didn't he do that? because he knew that their minds had already been made up. He knew that they weren't going to listen. And so he permitted them to go down a path that he knew wasn't going to bring forth the best for their lives and for the nation of Israel. In fact, a path that he knew was going to bring them much hardship and grief and heartache. He released them to their own will. He released them to their own will. Now, I'm not saying that God gave up his overarching will, but in this moment, in this circumstance, he released them to their own will. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Let's think about a person who chooses to go down a path of addiction, whether to drugs or alcohol or pornography or workaholism or addiction to exercise or addiction to food, to video gaming, addiction to your phone, you name it. We can become addicted to anything, right? We can make idols out of anything 
and everything. So let's say that we allow that addiction to take over our time and our thinking. Our time and our thinking. We can barely think of anything except that thing. When can, when, when can I get back to that thing? When can I get my next fix of this thing? I need it. I need it. Well, where is God in that? Where is God in that? If the thing that you can't stop thinking about or can't stop doing is taking the place of God himself in your life, meaning that God is, is not first anymore, God is second or third or fourth to your addiction, Houston, we have a problem. We have a problem. But here's the thing. God will let you go down that path. He, he will let you go down that path. He's not going to horse collar you, horse collar you back onto the path that he wants for you. He's going to let you go down that path. God will let you go. But the opportunity for God to use your wandering around in your self-made wilderness for your good and for his glory is always there. Let me say that again. God will let you go down a different path, but the opportunity for God to use the wilderness that you've made for yourself, to use this time of wilderness for your good and for his glory is always there. It's always there. It's always there. And we shall see as we continue to read that God will use the time of the kings, something that was not part of his perfect will. God will in indeed still use the time of the kings to bring forth a Messiah from the line of King David, a man who is described as a man after God's own heart. So do you think that sickness and disease and death, do you think that these are part of God's perfect will for us? Do you think that a pandemic that has so far taken the lives of over 30,000 people worldwide is God's perfect will for us? No, it is not. It is not. Sickness and disease and death are not part of God's perfect will for us. When God created the world and everything in it, including humanity, when he formed us from the dust and breathed life into our souls, sickness and disease and death were not part of his perfect will for us. And we can point to Adam and Eve all we want as the ones who blew that. <laughs> but if it wouldn't have been them, it would have been somebody else. I mean, it was really only a matter of time before someone used their free will to go against God's will and choose their own way over God's way. Adam and Eve get to be the ones who are known for that forever, but it could have been anyone else. Now, at that point, God could have turned away from us. God could have turned away from humanity, just turned away from us and said, that's it. You made your choice. You're on your own now until you die. Now that death is part of your reality and when you die, that's the end. That's it. So long. End of your story. End of the story. But God didn't do that. God couldn't do that because... The God who made us loves us. 
he loves us with a perfect everlasting love and he wants us to know him he wants us to know his love and he wants us to come back onto the path of his perfect will for us so that he can bring forth his best out of us with him so that he can help us to live out our best lives with him. God can use anything. God can use anything to bring about his perfect will for us and for our country and for the world. God can. God can use anything, including Israel's clamoring for a king, including a pandemic, including the things that we have set up as idols, in our lives, including the things that are maybe rising up inside of you in the middle of this quarantine that aren't all that pretty, maybe God can use anything because of Jesus' work on the cross for you and for me, because he can use anything to make all things new, to make all things new. He gives us a new heart. He gives us a new purpose. He brings us to a new place of setting our feet on the solid rock of faith in Christ. He gives us new hope. He gives us new freedom within his perfect will that, quite frankly, folks, changes everything. Listen to these words from Romans. This is chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And this is from the paraphrase of scripture called the message. By entering into faith, by entering through faith into what God has always wanted for us to do. Let me back up. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right for him, make us fit for him, we have it all together with God because of our master, Jesus Christ. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the very same moment that he has already thrown open his doors to us. And we find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. There's more to come, it says. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we're never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary. We can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Unquote. Now, who of you hearing the sound of my voice right now knows that this is true? That God uses our messes to bring forth his message of newness of life. That God uses the messes that we make for ourselves and brings forth incredible transforming messages of God's grace and goodness in our lives. I mean, we have stories to tell, right? We did this a couple months ago in worship. We just had people stand up and share some stories in their lives of how God got them through. And we should be sharing these stories with each other, especially now in the middle of this pandemic, I mean, to, to share with others how God has brought you through to a new way of life that has changed the traje trajectory of your life. Getting us to a place where we are leaning on him, when we are standing on his promises, when we are listening to his voice of peace in the middle of trouble. Becoming a person after God's own heart. Now, what does that mean? And what does it look like to be a person after God's own heart? 
Well, I think one way that we can learn that is to look at what it doesn't look like. I mean, Saul became the first king of Israel, but he was incredibly flawed. And it seemed at, at first as if he was about following God's ways, but it became obvious in not too long of a time that he really wasn't after God's heart. He was after Israel's heart. He took credit when his son Jonathan had won a mighty battle. He wasn't even there, but he took credit for the victory. Saul was all about image and prestige and popularity and, you know, all those sort of things that we hold dear, some of us. I mean, let's face it, we give in to those tendencies, a lot of us. We're, we're driven many times by what other people think of us by how we look, by what we wear, by what kind of phone we have, by what kind of apps we have on our phone, what kind of vehicle we drive, what our hair looks like, right? What kind of video games we play and uh, whether saying that we are a Christian is cool in a particular circle or not. We are, we give into these tendencies about what people are going to think of us, right? And that was part of Saul's downfall. He was concerned about himself and about his image. He didn't trust God. He was not a man after God's own heart. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel 13, 5 to 14. This is, we're going to learn about this. Um, this is a place where we begin to see really the downfall of Saul, the beginning of the end of his kingship. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets, among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul, the first king of Israel, remained at Gilgad, Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. And Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I've not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You've done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you, and if you had, if you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. Did you see that? And Saul was more concerned about his himself and what his lack of action was going to look like to his men. He was more concerned about that than about listening to God. I mean, he knew the law. He knew that a king was not allowed to offer sacrifices. He knew the Mosaic law. Only a priest can do that. He was supposed to wait for Samuel, but he took matters into his own hands. Now, I've never done that. A bit impatient, I mean. Ha ha, right? <laughs> I mean, we do this 
all the time, don't we? We we ask God to help us in some way. We seek for direction, but then we don't wait for him. We don't wait for his instructions. We want to resolve our situation, so we just do whatever seems right in our own eyes. Anybody want to put your hand up and confess that you've been there and done that? I've been there and done that more times than I would like to confess. It's hard to wait on a lot of things, right? It's, it's hard to wait for a package in the mail that you're excited about, bringing you something you, you're excited about. It's hard for a kid to wait for their birthday, especially if it's a big birthday, like the double digit birthday or, you know, the 16th birthday, you know, the milestone where you can go and, and start driving a car legally. It's hard to wait for your soldier to come home. It's hard to wait for your social security check each month. It's hard for us to wait to go back into public places again. It's hard for us to wait to gather as the church again. It's hard to wait for a cure for COVID-19. It's hard for us to wait for what we know God alone can do, heal. Restore. Revive. It's hard to wait for those things, for God to heal and restore and revive the church, revive our land. Revive. It's hard to wait, but I don't want to be like Saul. Do you? I mean, I don't want to miss God's best will for my life. And I don't want to miss God's best will for our church's life because I was too impatient to wait for it. Remember, we learned about God wants us to be fruitful. And in order for us to bear the kind of fruit that God wants us to bear, more fruit than is humanly possible but is possible with God, God said he has to cut the branches or he has to prove prune the branches that are bearing fruit but that can bear more fruit. I want the cutting. I want the pruning for my life and for the life of our church, even though it's painful. Don't you? I want us to be bearing so much fruit for the Lord that, that all we can say is ask God. That has to be God. There's no way humans could produce that much fruit for the kingdom on their own. I want to be a woman after God's own heart. I want our church to be filled, our communities to be filled with people who are after God's own heart. I mean, I know I'm going to fail because I'm a sinner. And I, I, I sin. I mean, but I pray that my sin will not be because of my disregard for God, which is what happened with Saul. But I pray that the sins that come are just because of my frailty and because of my weakness. Not that I'm making excuses for that, but that's just the truth of it, right? I am weak. And I sometimes am drawn to distraction and drawn off course. Now, let me put it another way as we think about a person after God's own heart. To Saul... Saul was king. To Saul, Saul was king. Saul saw the sacrifices before the battle as a way to win the battle, not really as a way to honor God. He just wanted God's favor for the battle. He didn't do it as a way to just honor God. Saul saw God as a means to achieve his own goals. And we do this. We go to God like he's Santa Claus, just asking for things that we want. We, we go to him like he's the magic genie in the bottle. We think if I just do these things in this particular way, God will grant me my, my wishes, right? 
Listen, friends, if we want to be followers of Jesus, if we truly want to be his disciples, then we need to remember that getting things from God, getting things from God, that's not the goal. That's not the goal. Knowing God is the goal. Knowing God, that's the goal. Being in a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ is the goal, which is only possible because of his shed blood for us and his broken body for us on the cross of Calvary. Being in a close relationship with God, worshiper to worshiped and yet father to child. This is the goal, but not so that we can get something from him, but so that he can bring his best from us. Not so that we can be known and exalted, but so that he can be known and exalted. Can I hear an amen? Psalm 27 is one of my favorites. It, it speaks to what we've been thinking about together today in the very last verse. It says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Isaiah 40 at the end is also beautiful. God says, to whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Asked the Holy One. Look up into the heavens. Who created the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Oh, Jacob, how can you say that the Lord does not see your troubles? Oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. The New King James translates that last verse, but those who wait upon the Lord. But those who wait upon the Lord. Waiting is hard. Trusting is hard. But not waiting. Not trusting just doing whatever seems right in your own eyes long term is a whole lot harder friends during this time of waiting for so many things let's wait patiently by the grace of God with trusting hearts in our God and in our King who has already given us everything that we need in Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together, okay? Almighty God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you enable us to do and to be more than we can think or imagine. Come now as we pray dwell within us in a new way. Make us strong to do your work and your will, even and especially now this work of prayer. We lift up to you, Lord, any across the world and across the street who are suffering in any way. Those who are sick, who are distressed, 
whose relationships are strained. Those who are lonely. Those in need of care. Those who are giving the care. Oh Lord, we lift them all up to you, knowing that you know. You know what is needed. I pray that you would unclog our throats and release our hands to come to you in prayer and praise, trusting you in a new way in this time with all the things that are on our hearts. We have so much to be thankful for. Open our eyes to see those things that are good around us so much. So much goodness, so much grace. Open our eyes to see and open our mouth to speak of it. Help us to turn off the TV and to listen instead to you and listen to the thoughts within us that are stirring up these, these times of blessings and thanksgiving and praise. And Lord, help us to be your people of prayer, not to neglect this all-important work of praying for one another, of entrusting those we love and those we don't even know but those you love, to your care, to your mercy, to your compassion. We know that that is enough because you are enough. Thank you, Lord, for how you are drawing us closer to you and to one another during this time. Oh, may we not squander it. May we make the most of it and May it not be lost when we are finally released to be with one another, present with one another again one day soon. Thank you, Lord. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Receive this benediction. This is a benediction from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, the Lord, be all glory and majesty and power and authority. Before all time and now and forevermore. Thanks be to God. Amen.